Okay, welcome back. Um, sorry, I kind of got cut off in the last uh, lecture segment there. Uh, I was talking about incomplete dominance, and uh, this is a case where alleles are uh, basically both going to be expressed, but they're going to give an intermediate phenotype between the parental phenotypes. So we saw this with a, a red flower and a white flower. F1 generation, you have pink, so it's a blending of red and white. Um, and then the F2 generation, you'll see both of the original parental phenotypes as well as the F1 phenotype coming out here. Another example is going to be multiple alleles. So I mentioned earlier that most genes are polygenic in nature, meaning they, uh, they require more than information from a single locus to actually be a complete functional trait. So this is multiple alleles. Uh, the ABO blood groups in humans are a good example of multiple alleles. And it's important to keep in mind that individuals at most carry two alleles, but there can be more than two alleles that exist in the population as a whole. Uh, with blood type, there are three alleles of a single gene that exist in the human population, and they are denoted by I superscript A, I superscript B, and little i. And then various combinations of those three alleles produce four different phenotypes. Um, this has to do with um, kind of an, it's like an ID tag on our red blood cells. Uh, it's, it's part of what's known as the glycocalyx of a cell. And it's a combination of uh, proteins and carbohydrates and lipids that, that give these uh, red blood cells a unique identity. So blood group, uh, blood type A, blood type B, you have two different um, types of organic compounds being made and contributing to the glycocalyx of these red blood cells. A, B is both of those types are being made, and then O is just the absence of, of both A and B. And then another interesting thing that comes out of this example is codominance. So multiple alleles and codominance, the fact that you can have both A type and B type coming together in type AB, that's an example of codominance. So both alleles are equally expressed in the phenotype. Uh, pleiotropy is when a single gene influences several traits. And this is an example with a sickle cell disease, an individual that's homozygous for sickle cell allele is going to have a sickled cell and that's going to influence the uh, hemoglobin. It's going to influence the shape of that red blood cell. That one trait influences all of these different things. So the abnormal hemoglobin crystallizes, causes the red blood cell itself to become sickle shaped, and then those sickled cells can lead to a cascade of symptoms, including weakness, pain, organ damage, and paralysis. So that's when a single gene influences several traits. Polygenic inheritance, uh, something I've mentioned before, the additive effects of two or more genes on a single phenotype. Skin color is a nice example of this. Um, you can have somebody with very light skin, producing a child with somebody with a very dark skin, the F1 generation is going to be pretty intermediate in skin type. But if you have these individuals uh, reproducing with individuals from other parental crosses, what you can see is this huge range in skin tone. And that's ultimately going to depend on how much uh, melanin is present in the cells of the epidermis. But we end up with this bell curve where we have this intermediate skin tone is much more common, but you can still see folks with very light skin and folks with very dark skin as a result. And that's polygenic inheritance. This is how most of our, of our traits are determined. Okay, so let's talk briefly about linked genes. 
Um, we talked earlier about how genes can recombine with one another, particularly in the F2 generation. Um, and alleles that start out near one another, physically close to one another on the same chromosome, tend to travel together during meiosis and fertilization. So this is that caveat to independent assortment that I mentioned earlier. Genes that are close together on a chromosome are called linked genes, and these linked genes do not tend to follow Mendel's law of independent assortment because they do tend to be inherited as a set rather than independently. So for example, if that first dihybrid cross I went over with cats, um, if fur color was linked to tail length, we would see white fur being linked with bobtail, and we wouldn't have any tan-colored cats uh, with a bobtail, for example. In the early 1900s, Thomas Hunt Morgan conducted studies on linked genes in New York City, and he used this very common model organism, Drosophila melanogaster, common fruit fly, uh, Fun thing about the Latin name or the scientific name here, Drosophila means lover of dew, Melanogaster means dark belly. So that's where we, that's where we get that um, scientific name from in the case of the fruit fly. Uh, wild type flies, uh, wild type is generally a term that's applied to animals that have the most common phenotype in nature. So a wild type fly has a gray body, genotype would be big G, big G, and long wings, and the genotype would be big L, big L. What Thomas Hunt Morgan did was he cultivated mutant fruit flies. Now, you think mutant, you think, oh my gosh, it's gonna have an extra leg or an extra antenna or something really crazy like that. But a mutant is just, in this case, a variation on the wild type. So a black body, which would be genotype little g, little g, and short wings, wings that don't extend past the abdomen like they do in wild types, that would be genotype little l, little l. Cross those with doubly heterozygous flies with the wild type phenotype. Doubly heterozygous, meaning they're heterozygous at both loci, the locus for body color and the locus for wing length. So I took these mutant fruit flies, crossed them with doubly heterozygous flies, and he saw some interesting things. So this is a dihybrid test cross. It's a cross between fruit flies that differ in two traits. We have our black body short wing fly here crossed with our gray body long wing wild type fly. And what we see here uh, in the offspring, um, we see the overwhelming majority of these offspring have the parental phenotype but we still have some recombinant phenotypes. So what's going on here? Why, why do so many of these individuals have the parental phenotypes? And so few have the recombinant phenotypes if alleles are always um, inherited independently of one another. So these, these are linked genes. They, they do tend to be inherited together. And um, crossing over, which I mentioned when I discussed meiosis, is, is why this happens. So black-bodied flies with long wings and gray-bodied flies with short wings, they are, they are still being produced. Um, even though these would be oftentimes considered linked genes. Um, the fact that we have crossing over between homologous chromosomes can actually produce those new combinations of alleles. So remember, crossing over is the exchange of genetic information between non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosome pairs. So we have a pair of homologous chromosomes here. Um, this would be gray body, this would be black body, this would be long wing, this would be short wing. What can happen, um, even with linked genes, is crossing over, and you can end up having these parental gametes 
that give you a recombination of the parental genotypes. Okay, so uh, talk briefly about sex determination in humans and fruit flies. Um, different species are going to have different chromosomes associated with biological sex. For humans, we have X and Y, and they determine our, uh, they determine our sex. What this means is we have uh, 44 uh, non-sex chromosomes as well as two sex chromosomes. If you're a male, you have one X and one Y. If you're a female, you have two Xs. And a female, of course, can only contribute an X. A male can contribute either an X or a Y. So it's ultimately the male that is going to determine the sex of the offspring. Uh, just through random chance. And this is going to differ depending on species. So it's not always X and Y, and it's not always females that are the sex that have, that have the same chromosome designation. There are a number of sex-linked disorders in humans that result from sex-linked genes. Uh, the X chromosome is much larger physically. There's more space on uh, that chromosome for various traits. And the Y chromosome is a lot smaller. Uh, what this means is, uh, oftentimes what this means anyway, is that males are much more susceptible to sex-linked disorders. Because a male is going to have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, if he inherits a disease causing a recessive allele on his X chromosome, he's not going to have another X chromosome as a sort of backup to provide a, a normal allele to mask the effect of the recessive disease causing allele. Uh, red green color blindness is a good example of this. It's characterized by a malfunction of light sensitive cells in the eyes. Um, what happens is uh, females are carriers for it, and uh, males tend to tend to have it more often. So if we have a normal color vision female um, have, having two children with a red-green colorblind man, uh, their daughter is going to be a, a female carrier. She's going to have uh, four children with another man who is uh, normal vision, and then you're going to see uh, the ramifications of that in their offspring. So they'll, they'll produce a red-green colorblind uh, boy, another female carrier, and then two individuals with normal color vision. Okay, finally, I want to talk briefly about this interesting example in dogs. Um, Merle is a coat pattern in dogs. Um, and Merle is denoted by the, uh, the dominant allele, big M. It's dominant to non-Merle. Um, what Merle is is basically this coat pattern where you have, oftentimes you have a background of white, and then you have some base color like gray or uh, tan, tannish red color, and then you have spots over that. Um, so all of these dogs are normal Merle dogs, they're all heterozygous at this locus. Um, what can happen here is um, if, you, if you breed two dogs that have the Merle coat pattern together, uh, for each puppy in such a litter, there's going to be a 25% chance that it will be known as a double Merle. So a normal Merle dog is always going to be heterozygous. So you have this Merle Australian Shepherd here. If you breed it with another Merle Australian Shepherd, what's going to happen here? You're going to have 50% uh, of the pups will be normal Merle, 25% will be non-Merle, and then 25% will be double Merle. I'm going to pause here and pick up in the next and last segment.